Dankeschön. Thank you, Music Team. With that, I'd like to invite up Sarah Mustafa, another one of our youth, who will be reading our scripture for today. Today's scripture reading comes from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 and 15, and Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. This is God's word. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, before I get to our uh, sermon for today, I do want to dismiss any children who will be going to kids' worship. Ms. Jill is standing by the side exit. Uh, the administrative wing, and uh, she has prepared for you a, a, a good time of, of learning about God and, and enjoying each other. First of all, I do want to say thank you. Oops, I was muted. My apologies. First of all, I do want to say thank you um, to those youth who participated in, in reading scripture for Kylie and for Sarah, uh, for Rachel, um, who's, who's running the uh, live stream for us, uh, for Nick, who was, who was on the drums. Um, it's so wonderful to be able to participate in the worship um, of God together and, and in leading other people in worship, so we are grateful for them using their gifts. You know, I, uh, I do love Graduate Recognition Sunday. Um, actually, I'm sorry, let's pray. <laughs> Father, we all need prayer. <laughs> we all need you. We need, Lord, your word. We need your grace and your compassion because we're imperfect and our work is imperfect. Lord, we need you because we experience um, brokenness in our lives and we need your word because we experience falsehood in this world and we so desperately need your truth and the reminder of your grace. I pray, Lord, that you would teach us by your word and your spirit. Lord, despite my own inadequacies, I pray that your word and your gospel would be clear to those who hear, that you might be praised and your people might be built up. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I want to talk with you about work. Not works, work. You know that thing that the average person spends about 30% of their life doing. For some of you, that's a, a wonderful idea, and for some of you, that's a rather dismal thought. <laughs> and you know what? That percentage doesn't even count education and work around the house, which I would certainly, and most of you, would consider work as well. It's a particularly relevant subject because today we're celebrating Graduate Recognition Sunday. And what's the question we always ask graduates? So what are you going to do? What are you going to be? And ultimately, this question has to do with work. Now, you know, I ask this question too, but I also try and ask other questions because this one, particularly in this day and age, places so much pressure on young people. Let me illustrate why it's even more challenging for young people to answer that question today than maybe in prior generations. I have a good friend uh, my age who's a small business executive in another state. And he's been job searching recently. Uh, one of the positions uh, that he was looking into and interviewing for was at an up-and-coming company that seemed to have a really good and exciting business culture. Anyway, he got to the third interview um, and was told that they were really looking for someone who was all in. Someone who was looking for something that was more than a job, more like a family, because they had a family atmosphere at their, at their work. Because they viewed work-life balance as being irrelevant if work and life were blended. They wanted someone who believed in the company and the team enough to find their purpose in the company's mission. 
a true believer. Now, you'd be excused for thinking, wow, this company must be amazing. They must have been saving the world, curing cancer, something like that. No, they made high-end travel backpacks. <laughs> Find your purpose in the mission of the company, high-end travel backpacks. I don't know, maybe it's possible. Um, high-end backpacks that apparently can also fulfill your search for meaning in life. My friend ultimately decided he was not interested in the job. He had a family and a child and realized that that job description isn't too appealing. You know, this situation, though funny, presents a good opportunity to reflect on ourselves. What's your relationship with your work? What's your relationship with work? Are we like this company, finding our value and identity only in what we do, how well we do it, and what others think of our work? Or how does God's word and the gospel inform our perspective on work? What I hope you'll see as we look at God's word is that it is God who gives our work dignity and value. It's because work itself is a good gift of God that we are called to work hard at whatever work we do. Genesis 1 and 2 give us the account of God making everything from nothing. And one of the most interesting aspects of that account is the last day, day seven, which Sarah read for us. Here, God is described as resting from his work of creation, and it emphasizes that word, work, three times. And while we often focus on God's rest when we look at these verses, what they also display is that God is a working God. It's in his nature to create and to nurture his creation, and he takes pleasure in his work. Each day there's the refrain, and it was good. And then it was very good. He takes pleasure in his work. He'd made the world and every creature in it, providing light, water, and land, day and night. And then the pinnacle of his creation, pinnacle of his creative work, he made mankind, as it says, in his own image. In the image of the working God, the nurturing God, the God who provides for all that is his. It's no wonder then that in chapter 2, verse 15, which Sarah also read for us, uh, when God provides man with a purpose, it involves work. We're our father's children, after all. It says the Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden to work it and care for it. In the beginning, there was work, and it was completely good and satisfying. The value of passages like this is that it tells us a tremendous amount about ourselves, about our own purpose. And actually, that's completely the point and goal of Genesis 1 and 2, to answer these big questions about life. And one of the biggest questions a person can ask is, what on earth am I here for? What am I here for? It's a question you might ask or if you go to college and take philosophy. It's a question that might be asked of you. What's my purpose? Well, here it is quite generally. We're not here for ourselves. We're here to work. We're here to work in a way that nurtures and governs God's created order in the recognition that it's his. We were made to work. Now, to some of you, this statement is not at all exciting because work can be really frustrating. Can anyone relate to work being frustrating on occasion? I mean, not me. I, my past 13 years in the Justice Department, super frustrating. Um, and and on Cap I spent three years on Capitol Hill, super frustrating being a pastor. It's perfect. You never experience any stress at all. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a liar. <laughs> no, but work can be frustrating, right? You might have heard the phrase, you know, I do what I got to do so I can do what I want to do. Perhaps many of you have said that. I've actually said that before. Um, again, not here. <laughs> no, but this expresses the idea that work isn't good. 
Work isn't good. It's a means to an end, but not good in itself. And we're tempted to think that way because of how difficult and unsatisfying work can be. The paycheck is a whole lot nicer than what it takes to get there. I work to make my leisure possible. Even writing a sermon, though, sometimes can be painful. I described it to Laura the other day. Uh, sometimes I get stuck and I feel like the words are flowing like peanut butter. That's, that's the phrase that I use. Well, the answer to why it's so frustrating is this little thing called sin. We didn't read this passage today, but Genesis 3 describes the story of humankind's original sin and its impact on all of life, but particularly our work. God had given Adam and Eve a command which they were deceived by the serpent into breaking, deciding that they knew better than God and that God was somehow keeping something good from them. From a certain point of view, this original sin could be seen as Adam and Eve deciding that they wanted to work for a different boss themselves. And the result is what we see in verse 17 of Genesis 3, God's curse on work. He says to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Now, work at that time was really all about agriculture. And so when he says cursed is the ground, it means that the field in which you work, what you spend your effort at to earn a living, to earn a livelihood, is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And this curse is real, and you know it. Whether or not you're a Christian in this room today, whether or not you believe this passage, you experience this. You experience it all the time. Whether working in the home, teaching and raising small children, um, in the school system, mowing the lawn, or in the business world, you experience frustration in your labor. As a result, we can tend to be so pessimistic about work because we experience how exhausting it can be and how its satisfaction doesn't last. You know, I think there's a beautiful illustration of this, uh, of this contrast between what work is supposed to be like and, and, and what work often is um, in the movie Chariots of Fire. Have any of you seen that before? In my opinion, it's one of the greatest films ever made. It centers on two British Olympic runners, Harold Abrahams and Eric Little, one self-absorbed and self-seeking, the other man who, a man who had decided to give his life to mission work um, in China, um, but who was a gifted runner at the same time. Abrahams at one point makes a statement that I believe characterizes the heart of dissatisfaction that comes from working for ourselves and not for the Lord. He says to another teammate, I am 24 and I've never known contentment. I'm forever in pursuit, and I don't even know what I'm chasing. This is a man who has achieved the pinnacle of his sport. He has worked and worked and worked, and he has this moment of blinding clarity that says, I don't know what I'm working for, because it's not satisfying. I know it's going to pass. I know I'm not going to be able to be like this forever. He's almost more afraid of winning than he is anything else because what comes next? Contrast this statement with that of Eric Little. He's been presented with an opportunity to run in the Olympics but has committed himself as a missionary to China. He's confronted by his sister <clears throat> who believes passionately in his mission work about the selfishness and wastefulness she sees in his effort spent running instead of focusing on this missionary labor, and he responds in the most profound of ways, and something that should be encouraging to you if you wonder about the value of your work. Speaking of his work in China, he said, I believe God made me for a purpose. He made me for China, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. That's such a beautiful statement, and you've probably heard that quote before. You see, Eric Little had something Harold Abrahams didn't have, something bigger than himself that he was running for, and it gave his running purpose and value, whether he won or whether he lost. He felt the pleasure of God in the running. 
Running was a part of his work, and he ran for the pleasure of God. Brothers and sisters, you were made to run. You were made to work. But what are you working for? What are you running after? This is where we come to the second truth I want to share with you today. It's that not only did God make you to work, but he made you to work for him and his glory. Not only did he make you to work, but he made you to work for him and his glory. In chapter 3, verse 23 of his letter to the Colossians, Paul writes, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. In this short statement, Paul makes a profound contrast with the world's perspective on work. We are to work ultimately with the understanding that God is our boss in all realms of life. In everything. Not ourselves, not our human bosses and managers. But what does this mean for you in your daily life? Does it mean that you need to make your work more spiritual? If if you're not working in the church or some uh, Christian mission? That you need to see the value of your work only in terms of the opportunities it presents to be about God's spiritual work or to share the gospel? You know, that's the perspective of some when they talk about work. And I, and I recall some examples of this from my time working in the government. People who demonstrated no diligence in their responsibilities, but for whom the name of Jesus came very quickly to their lips. I sometimes wish they'd have just kept quiet. That said, we are all indeed called to share our faith. But that's not what he's talking about here in this passage. That's not the only place that the dignity of work comes into picture. As Christians, we tend to segment our lives into the sacred on the one hand and the secular on the other. The things of God and the things of this world. Spiritual things are things we do specifically for God, like sharing our faith, teaching our children the scriptures, serving at church and in ministries of mercy, and we should absolutely be about those things. But then the secular is the work we do in the world, business, mundane things like managing the house and going to school. Here, though, Paul says that the separation of the secular and the spiritual in our lives as Christians is garbage. It's garbage. He's saying that our problem is that we have too low a view of our work when we divide it that way. We don't think highly enough of it. It's not that all Christians need to just do work which is inherently spiritual, but for the Christian, all work is inherently spiritual because you are in Christ and everything you do is done in him. For the Christian, all work is spiritual and and obtains its dignity from God. Whether it's doing the dishes, learning trigonometry, selling cars, managing a home, whatever it is. All work is spiritual for the Christian. In fact, it's just as spiritual as what I'm doing right now. You may not know this, but in Colossians 3.23, Paul is speaking to slaves and servants when he writes this passage. Not people who have the luxury of choosing their work. He's writing to people whose lot in life was to be about the most menial and mundane work imaginable. Yet he says for them to do this work for God. Martin Luther wrote on this idea extensively when he talked about the priesthood of all believers. He said, there's been a fiction by which priests and monks have been called spiritual, while princes and peasants are considered temporal or secular. This is an artful lie, he says. All Christians are in the spiritual estate, and there is no difference among them. We are all consecrated as priests. You see, what makes work spiritual is not what type of work you're doing. It's who you're doing it for. It's who you're doing it for. And as Christians, all life is to be for God. 
Paul says this again in 2 Corinthians 5.15 when he writes, And Christ died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The gospel changes everything for you, brothers and sisters, in the best and most hopeful way possible, even your work. He redeems it from the curse by making it oriented towards him. And more than that, he is the one who promises a reward. If you are in Christ, all your life is spiritual life under the lordship of Christ. So work for him, knowing that because of the gospel, your work matters. Now, what does this mean for you? Many of you work in the business world, government contracting. For you, it means to work wholeheartedly, to do it well, to be the best contractor that you can be, but also to be good and honest in what you do. If you're a salesperson, you are to honor God by selling as best as you can and to sell honestly. If you teach, you're to to apply your gifts wholeheartedly to teaching well, knowing that you're not just working for your principal, you're working for God. And what you do with your work in that space, you owe God an account of. And you do what's right, even when it's costly. If you're a student, you study for God. You study wholeheartedly. Your learning is not just for yourself, but for him. To use the gifts and abilities he's given you for his glory and the good of your neighbor. If you're retired, your work doesn't end. It just takes a different form. Whether it's through volunteer work or even the simply the work of prayer and care for those that you love. We all work. In this way, working with God as boss means that your dignity and value as a person come not chiefly from the nature of the work that you do, which will never fully satisfy this side of heaven, but it comes from who you do it for. It comes from the God you work for, and he will redeem and reward your labor. And that's the final thing I want to leave you with today. That because God made you to work and to work for him, it is God who will also reward you. Looking back to Colossians 3.24, we have one more amazing truth. He writes, you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Paul says that God rewards work done for him. And again, he's writing to household servants and slaves doing mundane tasks. Yet he says that for this work, this mundane work that the world wouldn't consider valuable or spiritual, they will receive an inheritance as a reward. That should really encourage you if you struggle with your job. If you struggle with your place in this world and the value of what you're doing, it should really encourage you. And this inheritance is not dependent on our doing our work perfectly, but on doing it for God, on being in Christ, the one who has worked perfectly for you, knowing that we can never work perfectly for him. Do you think about your work in this world this way? That not only does God call you to do your work wholeheartedly to please him as a first priority, but that he will reward your labor in this world. You know, there's a beautiful illustration of this principle in a book that my family and I have listened together. We we love listening to these dramatized audio stories. And this one is called Sir Knight of the Splendid Way. And it's an allegory, kind of like the Pilgrim's Progress, if you've ever read that. But it traces the story of a young man who has been made a knight, but is on a journey to the king's palace. And he encounters all these various situations along the way. Late in the journey, he comes to a small well. And it's at the top of a hill, tended by an old man in his declining years, at the sunset of his life. 
This old man was once a knight like this young man. He still wore the colors of his king. Once going around bravely on a journey, but at this point had been charged with tending this simple well, a well which he ends up dying defending. The narrator of the story comes along and explains to the young man who, who witnessed this scene of his death that the old knight had been tempted throughout his days with the desire to abandon his post, to see his work at this stage of his life, no longer on the journey but tending this small well, seeing it as insignificant, less important than the work of others. But he fought against this temptation because the king had given him that charge. Even though the eyes of the wor- through the eyes of the world, it was less significant than the work of other knights. Yet the narrator explains that it was not the worldly significance of his work or even the perfection of his work that would determine his reward, but the fact that he was a faithful servant of the king, doing what he had been called to do. And without even knowing it, Guarding this humble well protected streams, which protected rivers, which nourished kingdoms without the old knight ever realizing it. His work was significant to the king, and the king used it beyond his wildest imaginings. And his work would be rewarded by the king. I find this story really encouraging myself when I think of my own life. And this should be really encouraging to you, brothers and sisters, because the significance and value of your life and your work and the dignity of your work is different to God than it is to this world, no matter what stage of life you're in. In school, at the peak of your career, or retiring, you work for the Lord. You work for the Lord. He's made you for it. And the Lord will redeem your imperfect work for his glory, and he will reward you. So in all you do, work because you were made for it. Work hard for the Lord and not for man's praise. Work wholeheartedly, knowing that an inheritance beyond compare awaits you. Our God is worthy of it, and he gives you this work for your joy. Let's pray. Father, we do praise you and thank you that you made us for a purpose. You made us to work. Lord, we confess that work is hard, and we don't always like it because it's frustrating, and we see the curse um, of the fall every day. But Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to work, Lord, for you. And let that be enough. Whatever we're doing, Lord, let us work at it wholeheartedly and in a way that honors you, that you might be praised. And let us be content with the reward that you promise. Lord, we thank you for the gospel, for the hard work of Jesus Christ who went to the cross that we might no longer live for ourselves, but for you. That we might no longer live in our sin and be in bondage to its chains, but might be made new in Christ. I thank you, Lord, for everyone here, particularly for our graduates. We pray, Lord, that you would give them much work to do in this life for your glory and their joy. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.